May 14th, Sunday, 10 o'clock Mountain Time, 2017. Guys, I'm going to go back about 21 years, read you a, a quick article here that was written by a scientist out of the University of Chicago that had been studying interstellar matter. And she came to the conclusion that our solar system may be headed for an inner or an encounter with an interstellar dense cloud of gas. When I found out about this, did some thinking, and I just applied some common knowledge. This gas cloud would be basically marching to the beat of a different drum. And that's just some lingo for it's going to be vibrating at a different frequency. So, if our sun and our solar system were to be entering this denser cloud of gas, one of the first things that we should notice is a change in the frequency of our planet, whether it be the Schumann resonance, the ultraviolet. You can monitor these things and can kind of tell you where you're at. You can use these as navigation tools. But anyway, the, 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 the scientist goes on to say that um, our solar system may be headed for an encounter with a dense cloud of interstellar gas and dust that could have substantial implications for our solar system, according to the University of Chicago's astrophysicist Priscilla Frisch. And this is from 1996. The good news is it probably won't happen for 50,000 years. Frisch presented the results of her research Monday, June 10th at the meeting of the American Astronomical Society in Madison, Wisconsin. She had been investigating the interstellar gas in the local neighborhood of our solar system, which is called the local interstellar medium. The interstellar gas is within 100 light, 100 light years of the sun. The sun has a trajectory through space, and for most of the last 5 million years, said Frisch, it has been moving through a region of space between the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy that is almost void of matter. Only recently, within the last few thousand years, she estimates the sun has been traveling through a relatively low density interstellar cloud. This cloud, although low density on average, has a tremendous amount of structure to it. And it is not inconsistent with our data that the sun may eventually encounter a portion of the cloud that is a million times denser than what we're in now. And she believes the interstellar cloud through which we're traveling is relatively narrow. It's a narrow band of dust and gas that lies in a super bubble shell, expanding outward from an active star formation region called Scorpius Centaurus. When this super bubble expanded around these stars, it expanded much farther into the region of our galaxy between the spiral arms, where our sun lies. Because the density is very low, it didn't, or Frisch said, it didn't expand very far in the direction parallel to the spiral arms because it ran into a very dense molecular cloud. So the solar wind flux of charged particles streaming from the sun's corona protects the Earth from the direct interaction with the interstellar medium by enveloping the Earth and all the planets in the heliosphere, the region of influence of the solar wind. The heliosphere is currently, or the heliosphere currently extends a hundred times farther from the sun than the distance between the Earth and the sun. We think of the heliosphere, we think the heliosphere might be much larger before we entered the interstellar cloud, Frisch said, but that's something we can't say for sure. But if the solar system encountered a much denser cloud, Frisch estimates that the heliosphere could be compressed to within one or two astronomical units of the sun. That right there is, is astounding. Not much greater than the Earth's distance from the sun. There would be dramatic effects on the inner solar system, Frisch said. It would immediately change the whole interaction between the solar wind and the interstellar medium. Researchers have predicted increases in the cosmic ray flux, changes in the Earth's magnetosphere, the chemistry of the atmosphere, 
And you know what that chemistry of the atmosphere does? That chemistry manages the UV light um, and perhaps even the terrestrial climate. So this is a big deal. They've been monitoring this at spaceweather.com. They've been doing an excellent job. The um, cosmic rays are intensifying. This is a piece he's had on here for many days now. Many people think the solar minimum is boring, wrong. During the nadir, the nadir, which is the the bottoming, the bottoming out, the low point of the sunspot cycle, the entire heliosphere changes its personality with many consequences for the space around our planet. One of the most important changes involves cosmic rays, high energy radiation reaching Earth from deep space. As sunspot numbers decline, cosmic rays intensify. Is this actually happening? The answer is yes. Spaceweather.com and the students of Earth's to sky calculus have been monitoring radiation levels in the stratosphere um, that's where the ozone's at, by the way, um, with frequent high-altitude balloon flights over California. And here are the latest results. And you can see from May of 2015, or March of 2015, through May of 2017, they found an increase of 13%. And we haven't even hit solar minimum yet, or the grand solar minimum. The data shows cosmic ray levels intensifying with an uh, approximately 13% increase. Cosmic rays are high-energy photons and subatomic particles accelerated in our direction by distant supernovas and other violent events in the Milky Way. Usually cosmic rays are held at bay by the sun's magnetic field, which envelops and protects all the planets in the solar system. But the sun's magnetic shield is weakening. In 2017, as the solar cycle shifts from solar maximum to solar minimum, more and more cosmic rays are therefore reaching our planet. How does this affect us? Cosmic rays penetrate commercial airlines, dosing passengers and flight crews enough that pilots are now classified as occupational radiation workers. Some research shows that cosmic rays can seed clouds, triggering lightning, this is true, and potentially altering weather and climate. Have we seen climate chaos lately? You bet we have. And further studies have proven a link between cosmic rays and uh, cardiac arrhythmias in the general population. So, this is not a good thing, especially when you read the piece up here above. Sunspot counts are plummeting. Today is the 33rd day in 2017 that the sun has been blank. In 2016, there were only 32 days total, so it's already eclipsed 2016. And that's a pretty good indication that we're headed for the solar minimum, which is going to make our protective layer from the sun even weaker. The accelerating pace of the spotless is a sign, or the spotlessness is a sign of the solar minimum. Forecasters expect the sun cycle, which swings like a pendulum between a high and low sunspot every 11 years, to reach its nadir, that's the low spot, in 2019 and 2020. There's another piece over here. Oh, this is the, the Bartol, which I know this has been, um, I know for pretty certain this has been altered. We don't get the real data on here anymore. We used to until it started spiking uh, drastically. And then they started taking those off. So, but anyway, here's some more information on the intensifying cosmic rays, what they're going to do to Earth, what it's going to do to the climate. And... Things are going to get very interesting, guys. This is no joke. They're talking about a, a little ice age, possibly. Uh, and there's some mixed mixed opinions on this, just like everything. And that's good. you got to have you know, different points of view because none of us really know for sure. Because um, there's a lot of variables involved here. But the bottom line is, Grand Solar Minimum is approaching... Cosmic rays are intensifying, and it's going to affect Earth's climate. And you've already seen it affect Earth's climate. I mean, knee-deep hail, really? Uh, flooding all over the globe. Hardcore climate change. And it's only going to get worse. So, 
this is something I've, I've been pondering on. I'm going to stay on this. I'm going to get some more information on this for you guys. I'm sure you're you're probably already well aware of this, but there's something else I want to share with you. And I've known this for a while, um, and I I just don't like I don't even like talking about it, but I'm going to. We have to. This here is from a Russian um, astrophysicist. According to him, we're already in that cloud. We're in a two million year old supernova. So over here on this side is a two million year old cosmic ray cocoon. And here's the cloud, the bubble. So according to this, we're already in it. And we're holding up pretty good. But I don't like the fact that we're going into solar minimum right now. That concerns me. It really does. So I'm keeping a very close eye on the frequencies around Earth. And, and we're learning. You know, it's a learning process for us too, myself included. Um, but... I think the, the, the values, the, the, the multipliers, they need to be changed for the UV. They really do, because it's changing. And that's why we're monitoring it every single day. So I think we're in this cloud already, or at least on the edge of it. So anyway, guys, that's all I've got for this. It's a pretty big deal. We're going to keep a very, very close eye on this as time moves forward. We're going to constantly monitor the things that we can, you know, like the UV, which is a frequency. Everything's frequencies. Frequencies, frequencies, frequencies. So that's one thing that we can monitor. We can look for change in it. And if we see change in it, we can't just automatically dismiss it as, as, as faulty data because, no, I don't believe that. There is legitimate change. You can feel it on, in your skin. So we can't be in denial anymore. So we're going to stay on this, monitor it, and keep a close eye on the UV. During these uncertain times, I encourage you to be brave, be strong, be wise, and be ready, my friends. Thanks for watching.